Thanks, Jill. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome, and thanks for thanks for taking some time out of your evening. I think it's mostly evenings by the backdrops that I'm that I'm seeing. Uh, it's great to be here. I, I will uh, give some introductions, and then I will I'll bow out and let the uh, let the night belong to the two deans, um, which I'm really excited about as an opportunity for you all to get to hear directly from them instead of you know through me, which was sometimes happens. Um, but, but I think I'll start in alphabetical order. I, I'd love to uh, introduce first uh, Nikki Chambers and tell you a little bit about how her position evolved here and how we were fortunate enough to get Nikki uh, to Williston. Um, so first of all, uh, just, just so folks know, um, diversity, equity, inclusion work is not brand new to Williston with, with Nikki's arrival, but the big change was that we went from having a sort of a part-time uh, role to a full-time role at a dean's level that reports directly to me and has a seat at the table with the board of trustees. So a much more elevated um, uh, presence, both in the organizational uh, work of the school, but also in, in the expansiveness of, of what, in this case, Nikki is able to do. Um, and we feel really lucky to have Nikki here. Uh, I will say this right from the outset, that Nikki and Corey and I work really closely together. Our offices are proximate. And um, it's become a wonderful uh, chance for me to work with two incredible people uh, right from the get-go. And Nikki tends to count uh, the number of days that she's here, or months or weeks or whatever it is. And the last time I knew, we were sort of in the three months and, and double digits. But I'll let, I'll let her tell you, tell you about that. Um, Nikki comes to us most recently from Smith College in the admissions office there. And her career, her professional career, has been in college admissions. Um, and Nikki was known to us through a colleague, Catherine McGraw, who's our director of college counseling. And that dated back to uh, their time together at Mount Holyoke College, where Nikki was an undergraduate. So we had a little bit of an inside track, which didn't mean um, that uh, we didn't search broadly, which we did. Uh, but we had a little bit of an inside track with Nikki. Um, and I, I was a real um, proponent of the notion that folks coming out of the college admission side, very specifically, uh, had a skill set and an understanding of schools and especially young people that uh, were ideally suited for what we had in mind for Williston. And I can say unequivocally uh, that I never say this. I will say I was right. <laughs> I feel I feel uh, I feel wonderfully right in this moment with Nikki here because everything that I'd hoped for and more is is true with her arrival. Um, as I said, she went to Mount Holyoke College. She holds a master's degree from Columbia University's Teachers College. Uh, after college, she uh, was a one-year person for Teach for America, which is a really exciting program that I'm sure many of you have heard of. Uh, and then at Smith College, she had a number of functions that dovetailed right into what we're doing here. Notably, she supervised uh, the multicultural recruitment team there. Um, and she also was uh, uh, created the office, uh, a multicultural admissions advisory committee at the school. These are all things that are, are, are clearly dovetailing into the work that she's already demonstrated and done um, and done for us here. Um, so Nikki is a is a, uh, a, a immediate impactful presence on campus. Uh, I'm going to tell one story on you, Nikki, which is that um, since she had not been as familiar with with secondary school ed, I told Nikki that, you know, when she got here, she was going to be a kid magnet, that kids were just going to glom right on to her. And I knew that really based on 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 her personality and her attributes and her expertise. And uh, Nikki was like, really, Bob, I'm not sure that's gonna be the case. And you can ask her, put a, put a question in chat, but it, that's also mostly been, mostly been the case and mostly been true. So wonderful uh, to have Nikki um, with us. And, and I feel very fortunate and honored to call her a colleague. Um, moving to Corey Fogg. Uh, Corey, uh, Corey also, I guess uh, it's fair to say, had a little bit of an inside uh, uh, knowledge track of the school because she's a proud Williston alum from the class of 99. And um, again, we did an extensive search. Uh, Peter Valeen had been the Dean of Faculty here for about 12 years, the whole time I've been head of school. And uh, it, it, this was an opportunity for us to look broadly and to infuse the school with a perspective and a knowledge base that we didn't have at the time. And I can't tell you how lucky we are uh, that Corey decided that she would uh, return to her alma mater because after a uh, extensive search that had inside candidates and outside candidates, um, Corey clearly distinguished herself as, uh, as uh, a clear um, 
uh, clearly head and shoulders um, above folks in terms of her experience and knowledge. And it's really deep in curriculum development, in faculty hiring, in diversity hiring, in all ways that really matter um, to schools when you're trying to have a relevant curriculum and trying to have the best faculty you can possibly have. So her resume sort of reads like a how-to manual on how to do that. I'd like to highlight just a couple things. Um, she's a co-author of a workbook with um, nationally known uh, educator Rachel Simmons um, on uh, Enough As She Is, An Educator's Guide. Uh, and just that alone, uh, an insight into, into the world of girls and young women has been you know, really um, impactful and will, will continue to be going forward for Williston. I mentioned that because we're in the 50th anniversary celebration year of co-education at, at Williston Northampton School. So it makes, uh, it makes great synergy that, that um, Corey's, Corey's here joining us. So both of these are uh, accomplished um, uh, women in their field and what they're bringing to Williston, as I suggested, of fresh eyes, expertise, experience has been um, absolutely amazing in the first three, whatever we are, two and a half months of the school year. And I expect a lot, a lot more uh, uh, good news to report from both of them. So uh, that's what I got introducing my two newest colleagues and my two closest colleagues uh, in the office world here. Um, so Jill, I'll turn it back to you. And again, I just like to say thanks to folks for turning out and, and giving us a part of your evening and, um, and learning more about Williston and all the exciting things that are happening here right now. So have a good evening. Thanks, Bob. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. And um, Nikki and Corey, I'm going to give you the power to unmute yourselves. So um, we'll get you set up so you can share a little bit about yourselves in your early days here. And we're going to unmute you both at once and feel free to uh, collaboratively speak or share what you've learned about each other in these early days as, as new colleagues. Um, let's start with, we'll do the reverse of Bob. I'll go in reverse alphabetical order and ask Corey to just share a little bit um, about her journey uh, from Williston back to Williston and uh, what she's observed and learned in her first, uh, what, eight, 10 weeks at the school? Yes, thank you, Jill, so much. Um, so I'm delighted to see you all. Welcome back via Zoom. It's really nice to join you. Um, I hope to see you on campus in the coming months, days, years. Um, I want to preface all my comments tonight by letting you know that life is real at Williston Northampton. So tonight I happen to be the Dean on duty. So I have the duty phone and if it rings, Jill will unmute, she will mute me again and I will manage the, the moment of need, you know, whether it's rushing off campus to grab something or it's a true calamity that I'm sure we will handle with panache. Um, but, uh, just wanted to let you know that that is not my phone. It is the duty phone indeed. So, um, um, thank you for that grace. Um, so as Jill said, um, yes, I'm delighted to be back um, to be rejoining the Williston community. Um, as, as Bob mentioned, I'm a member of the class of 1999, and I feel very strongly about my Williston experience as truly influential in, in the formation of my identity as a student, um, as, a, as a young woman, and um, as someone who discerned uh, teaching as a vocation. Um, and I use that word very explicitly that I think about my own experience in education as a true calling. Um, the way I've been describing it to folks is when I was a student at Williston, it was well before jargon was populating the industry around the concept of holistic education, really treating and working in service of the whole child. Williston was doing that from its inception, I think, and that was certainly my experience in the late 90s. That's That's been my experience as an alum. I think the Advancement Office and Office of Alumni Engagement has continued to walk with me on my path as a professional woman, and I'm, I'm really delighted to be supported by an institution well into my um, now older age. Um, and it is, it is a joy, truly, to be back in service of a mission that I believe in so firmly in the fact fabric of my being. Um, I moved back on campus into a beautiful home and I'm delighted to be a member of the Williston residential community um, right here on Payson Avenue. It's a short walk to my office. Um, and I can tell you that campus is as beautiful as you could imagine it. Um, it's, it's a wonderful, Ellie has a great background, which gives you the, the fall picture of what we look like right now. The leaves are changing, the students are 
finding the joy again, as Bob keeps encouraging us. Um, we're coming off a very challenging year, as I'm sure many of you are, and the students are really enjoying the return to um, what we're calling a recovery year on campus as we seek to not return necessarily to normal, but do everything that we can to ensure that students are having a a true sense of belonging, a renewed sense of place and space and community, um, recovering from a very challenging year for our world and certainly for our nation and our schools. So really delighted to be back on campus. Learning is continuing. Classes are joyful and boisterous. Students are outside in new ways. I keep talking about COVID keepers and the things that we've learned from COVID to help us teach more dynamically and flexibly. Uh, it's just a beautiful time to be on campus and see learning lived in every corner of the school. So um, as Bob said, you know, I'm, I can share with you my journey. I'm, I'm a proud Boston College alum, but I'm a prouder Williston Northampton alum. And so um, really discerned education and, and followed that path into public school. Um, I went into some teaching in some Catholic boarding schools, Catholic day schools, um, also a junior boarding school. And, and I just knew that Williston would someday be a place that I would come back to. And I was delighted when um, uh, Bob shared the position with me and, and really enthusiastic about the, the administration and Bob's goals. Um, and most expressly, I say as an alum, I was really felt very galvanized and inspired by the board's commitment to DEIB. And I can't echo enough what an absolute privilege um, and learning experience it is for me to work alongside Nikki Chambers. Um, I think she's a true gift to the school and she's learning with me and we're pushing Bob in new directions and, and he's pushing us. And so really very excited to be part of this team. I think that's the most context that I can share for now. I'm delighted to um, share uh, Nikki Chambers and her background as well, let her speak for herself and, and then we'll joyfully answer some questions. Thanks, Corey. It's also an honor to learn and grow from you as well. Um, and I am so excited about the momentum that we've already made and what more we have to do together. Um, to all of you, thank you so much for taking the time to be in conversation with us today. Um, my name is Nikki Chambers. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I am so honored to be serving as Dean of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging here at Williston. Um, Bob gave a little bit of an introduction into my bio, so I'm just going to flesh it out a little bit further. Um, I was raised Jersey strong, so I grew up in northern New Jersey, um, and I went to Mount Holyoke College, which was my first introduction into the Pioneer Valley, um, where I was just overcome with the bucolic beauty of this region, where I was, um, where I had my first kind of taste into an educational experience that truly felt transformative as a graduate of a gender inclusive women's college. Um, so I really accredit that experience as um, giving me that space and that voice to um, really enter spaces confidently and share my voice. Um, and for the past 10 ish years, I've been in higher education. I've worked at Mount Holyoke College, I've worked at Barnard College for an incredibly long time. And then I was at Smith before I made my transition over to Williston. Um, but in as much as I love enrollment management and the dynamic aspects of that industry, something that I was just so desperately missing was current student engagement. Um, and while I was working in enrollment management, um, issues pertaining to access and inclusion always remained at the core of my why. It was my purpose, um, it was my passion, and it was what kept me honest in my work. Um, so for me, issues of DEIB are not new to me at all. Um, it's just applying it in a really new and dynamic way. Um, it's exciting and also slightly daunting to be building a department. Um, but it, there are so many possibilities that um, we have. We have this amazing strategic plan that is our North Star as we think about um, how we're going to implement and make Williston the best place that it can be. A place that's going to foster a sense of belonging for each and every student that's on campus. A community that is committed to equity. A, com a community that is um, dedicated to inclusion. Um, and a community that is dedicated to increasing diversity in all of its forms. Um, so I don't want to, uh, you know, yammer on too much, um, but I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited to answer all of your questions that you might have. Um, and Bob is right. I do keep track of how many days I've been here, uh, more so as a reminder that Rome wasn't built in a day and that we are going to continue to put one foot in front of the other. Um, but we are going to take intentional and deliberate steps so that 
we can actualize all of the incredible goals that have been outlined in our strategic plan that I happen to have right here, but I know that my, my, um, my screen is a little blurry, but um, I keep it next to me. It's kind of my sense of staying guided in our work. So um, that's a bit about it. Like I said, I'm so thrilled to be here um, with all of you today. I'm thrilled to be working with the senior leadership team that we have. Um, they're inspiring. They have such incredible institutional knowledge. So they teach me as much as, um, as it's, it's a joint exchange of knowledge, I think. So that's all I have. Thank you, Nikki. So I think what we're going to do is um, ask everyone if your screen view has changed, go ahead and find the little icon that lets you come into gallery view again so that we sort of feel as if we're all together here. Um, so if your view has shifted so that you are only seeing the speaker, go ahead and, and find the gallery view and come together as a group. So while everyone was, I think, listening so closely, I don't have any notes here in the chat yet that anyone has a question, but if you do have a question, please feel free. You can use the raise hand function, which is the button that is in reactions. And you can just go there and there's a little bar that says raise hand. You can raise your hand as if we're in a class. You can put a little note to me in the chat that says, I have a question for um, one of these women. Uh, and everybody listening raptly, but I'm sure you have questions. So I guess um, I'll jump in. I'll jump in with an easy question or maybe not an easy question for Corey. Um, what was it like for you coming back to a place where you had a certain uh, perception of the faculty. And in fact, you might've been taught by some of the faculty. And what are you doing to bring together your new colleagues um, in this new environment where, you know, sort of, as you said, we're not really, we're not out of COVID. It's a different time. Can you talk a little bit about your approach there? Sure, thank you, Jill. Yeah, um, I remember when interviewing with Bob, I did, explicitly say that I'm not making any misconceptions about returning to the halls of 1997. Um, and so I, I can say with, with great um, conviction that the school is um, better than it was when I was here. It was at a great school for me and, and for the Fogg family, that is for sure. Um, but it is absolutely just a space and place that is truly invested in its people. Um, and I mean that when I say it's, we're invested in our alums, we're invested in our parents, our grandparents, our students, our faculty, staff, um, it's really just grown um, tremendously. And so, you know, I am delighted to be back now working with some of the teachers who, again, inspired me to become a teacher. Um, and that's a real gift. Um, and they've welcomed me with such grace, welcomed my family back to campus, which is really wonderful. Um, I think, you know, speaking to a specific to a couple of very specific changes that I've been um, inspired by. Um, I think, as I mentioned, the school's commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging is, is laudable um, and, and really making, as Nikki referenced, conspicuous efforts and very conspicuous goals um, so that we're holding ourselves accountable for the things that we have planned to do. Nikki and I are really looking forward to digging into diversity recruitment and specifically an area of research that I've enjoyed and, and found some real um, competency in, and I guess for lack of a better term, is around diversity retention. Um, and really ensuring that we're retaining folks who are coming to Williston um, to serve the school's mission. Um, and so that's very exciting. We're focusing on the student experience, cultivating a sense of belonging, um, wanting students to find both windows and mirrors in their learning while here. Um, I also think the commitment to expanding the physical plant of the school is really wonderful to see lived. And that's a very, um, you know, optically clear um, investment. So, you know, if, if you are able to come back to campus, seeing the residential quad is incredible. So what we've done to expand and enhance student living um, and also to ensure that our faculty um, are able to live a, in, in a space and place where they can be comfortable and really flourish as well, um, because the demands of the job are real and it's it's a wonderful gift to be part of this residential community and it's it's a lot of time invested um, and so that's a real retention and recruitment tool as well 
Um, I also think that um, something that I've done explicitly in my short time back at the school is set up one-on-ones with every single faculty member. So that's been a real joy. I've had a chance since arriving in July to sit down for 30 minutes with every faculty member and, and really just come to know what are their joys, what are their challenges, and, and what are they hoping for from me as the new dean of faculty. So that's been a real gift. All right, thank you. And that was uh, actually a nice segue into um, a question we had from Gordon, who stepped away for a minute. So um, I'm going to go over to you, Roy. Do you want to unmute and go ahead and uh, ask your question? And then Gordon will come back to you after Roy. Thank there you. Go. Uh, I was wondering what your overall enrollment goals are for Williston. And uh, uh, Specifically in the nine through 12 grade is my first question. I'm gonna toss that. Yeah. I think, uh, Corey, I, I can also uh, toss that over to Eric Yates who happens to be on the call here. And I think that this is a question, Roy, um, both parts of your question I think uh, can be most accurately answered by our colleague, Eric Yates, who is the chief <sighs> advancement officer. Hi, Roy. Uh, yeah, no, just to, to gloss on that, um, right now uh, we have about 470 uh, you know, students in our upper school, and we took a major step toward addressing some of our um, construction needs to house that level of student body with our new residential quad. So we completed the uh, Emily McFadden Vincent house uh, last September. That houses 40 girls and uh, two years prior, we opened a new dorm to house 40 boys in John Hayes and White House. So that residential quad houses about a little bit more than half of our boarding population. We do not at this point expect to increase the size of the school overall, the upper school. We're looking at primarily keeping fairly steady in terms of the uh, population there. So. So in terms of our, our construction needs around residential, student residential housing, we're feeling pretty good. We, we do have some, those of you who may have lived uh, across the street in Sawyer or Conant, uh, Swan Cottage, that area, those buildings still exist. They're not used for student housing right now. They're primarily for faculty housing. Um, and the school and the board of trustees has some decisions to make about how to most appropriately use those properties in the years to come, but we do not anticipate using it for student residential housing. We intentionally tried to bring the community a little closer together. So, so I don't know if that answers your question, but that's uh, great. Great. Right. Thank you, Eric. Um, Gordon, your question is a great one for Nikki. So if you'd like to unmute and ask her, if you're able to hit your space bar or unmute. There you go. Oh, so Nikki, um, I'm Gordon Cadugan. I'm a uh, 1963 graduate of Williston and uh, love the school, love my education and uh, have supported Williston um, ever since uh, I graduated. Uh, my question was, uh, I'm seeing uh, this new diversity push. I, I don't want to call it a push, but um, endeavor in uh, my colleges um, and schools. And I wonder where that um, where that drive is coming from, where that impetus is coming from. Um, I think it's a wonderful uh, place to begin. I wonder what just what's driving it. Yeah, and I'm sure that um, Eric and Jill and Ellie and Corey might have greater insights just due to the institutional knowledge they have about Williston specifically. But um, I would just kind of go back to what Bob said earlier is that deep, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging work has been something that Williston has done for a pretty long time. It's been 
something that has existed in other roles part-time. So I know that before I arrived, um, Aaron Davey, who is, uh, was, the assistant, uh, was the assistant dean for community life, and she really took on diversity, equity, and inclusion work before I got here and has been doing it for the past couple of years. She's been um, the force behind Why Not Speak Day, which is an annual event um, here at Williston where DEIB conversations are at the forefront and there are no classes because DEIB initiatives have to exist in tandem with the teaching and learning that's happening in the classroom. They are not separate from one another. They are issues that have to happen in tandem. Um, and we also knew that um, I think for Williston that um, the year of 2020 brought some really hard lessons to Williston. Um, and I think I was very proud to see that Williston took on those challenges they heard the feedback from alums and realized that they there were ways that they could do this work more intentionally and more deliberately. Um, so Williston really answered the call um, in that way. Um, and when I was first hired, um, the, the job was Dean of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And I asked Bob to, ask, to add the B for belonging because I want every student, no matter where they come from, no matter what their racial background is, to feel that they authentically can show up in this space as themselves and be celebrated and be educated and feel secure and feel safe in um, the community here. So um, I think the driving force behind that honestly has been a couple of things. It's been the work that Williston has already been doing, but I think it's been ramped up by, you know, realizing it's 2020 and our world, not just Williston, but our world has to grapple with some really hard truths about race and racism in this country. Um, and that we have done things that have been really great, but we also have fallen short and we wanna do better. Um, so that's what I see as kind of the impetus for that. And I hope that was helpful. Gordon, did that, did that really get at the heart of what you're asking? Um, uh, that, that's fine, that's, uh, that's a good start. Um, and yeah, I certainly uh, agree with you. Um, sorry, uh, I certainly agree with you. We have fallen short. Um, and for many of us, we did not even realize we were falling short. So thank you for that. Yeah. I would also add um, that uh, I think Gordon, it's a great question, and it's um, it's something that has been challenging for me as a white educator in schools in the last three years is wondering why schools suddenly are paying attention to an issue and to issues related to the human experience that have existed for decades. I mean, we've been teaching American history about um, issues related to diversity, equity, and belongings in schools. We make it a mandatory course for children in the United States, um, and schools have only very recently, some schools created these positions and, and made a very conspicuous focus. Um, and, and I think that's challenging for me as a white educator who's, who's really longed to have more diversity in my colleagues. I learn and grow, and I, I, I would like to think that I compliment my colleagues as they learn and grow, especially if there's diverse um, representation across gender, socioeconomics, religion, politics, um, cultural identification, you know, family construction, you know, sexual orientation, et cetera. I mean, we need variety. That's the world we're going into. And our students need to see themselves reflected in their school. Um, and I would also just add that I think there has been a pretty critical exodus of BIPOC faculty and staff from independent schools in the United States over the last 10 years. Um, and so as we do analysis on why our employees who identify in a category, um, in one particular category, why are they leaving the profession? What are we doing that we could remedy? Is there an issue related to uh, support or professional development, affinity, um, community and belonging. And, and the truth is that there are, you know, trackable pieces of data in that exodus. Um, so I'm really excited that uh, to be part of the focus on that at Williston, how can we recruit and retain a more diverse faculty and continue this focus that has already started. I know that, you know, enrollment um, management office is also very focused on ensuring that we have a, a highly diverse student body. 
um, so that our school can really represent the world in which our children are headed off to lead and serve. So I would just add that piece as well. Thank you, Corey. And I would also, your, your comments spark something else that I wanted to state, because I think it's really important that issues pertaining to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging are all cultural competencies that all of our children need in order to thrive academically, socio-emotionally. Um, I mean, we see where the US Census data is telling us where our country is going. We know that we are, um, we are gonna be competing in a 21st century economy, right? A globalized economy. And we need to make sure that students, regardless of where they come from, are culturally competent so that they can compete and so that they can thrive and be successful in this world. Um, I know these are sort of early days, Nikki, and so tell me if this is, this question gets into into more uh, more doing when I know that you're still in an actively taking in phase. But could you talk a little bit um, while being both specific and general about what one does to create a feeling of belonging? How do you make someone feel like they belong? So if we could talk a little bit about the heart of your role. Yeah, um, that's a great question. And what an interesting balance to strike to be both general and specific at the same time. Um, so I've been here for about three months. And I think one of the ways that you foster a sense of belonging is um, closing my mouth and listening and hearing what people have to say. A little listening can go a very long way. Um, and one of the things I've started to do was offer listening sessions to community members. I started with faculty um, and depending upon who the faculty member is or who the staff member is, these sessions can last anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour um, where I'm sitting there typing furiously and asking questions related to DEIB, right? Like, what are your challenges in this role? Do you feel empowered or equipped to interrupt bias? Do you feel empowered or equipped to champion inclusion in your work? Um, what do you see as immediate DEIB needs that must be addressed in this community, right? Like, so trying to ascertain what the culture and climate is around DEIB right now. Um, our strategic plan, which I shared in the chat, tells us really specifically and concretely, and dare I say boldly, where we want to go, right? This plan is supposed to take us for the next five years, right? It's 2021 to 2026. But what we don't know or what we don't feel like we have concrete information on is where are we right now? And as Corey mentioned, we're in a recovery year with COVID, but I would also argue that we're in a recovery year as it pertains to DEIB. And what I wanna make sure that we do is that we're doing this work together as a community um, and we're keeping people whole while we do it. Now, keeping people whole doesn't mean that we're gonna keep them comfortable. We are going to keep them safe enough so that people can learn and people can grow. And I mean, I think we can all speak to moments where we've been uncomfortable, but it's been in those moments of discomfort that we had some really great breakthroughs and opportunities for growth. Um, so I think fostering a sense of belonging is listening to what people have to say, offering folks opportunities to learn where they um, explicitly or maybe not so explicitly express that, um, and also making sure that we are all doing this work together and that all channels, because I know a lot of people have been doing DEIB work on their own. Um, one of the things that I'm also working on is making sure that all of those roads lead back to the office of DEIB, um, because I want to make sure that people who are doing this work don't feel like they're doing it in a silo, but that they have the support of um, my office and the senior administration. Thank you. So it is really a fully integrated uh, undertaking here that reaches across all areas of the campus and is not just uh, confined to your role with the students or your role with the faculty or your role. It's a really wide encompassing undertaking. Um, Absolutely. That you're... <laughs> so um, still time for people to just throw into the chat that you have a question or to use the hand raise function. And I am happy to call on you. But while I'm waiting for someone to come up with a question, um, for both of you, we'll let Corey have a turn to answer because I keep worrying that her phone's going to ring and she's going to have to leave us. Um, what surprised you the most about being back at Williston or at Williston today, entering into this role? What surprised you the most? That's a really great question. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll embarrass him. Um, I, I just have to say very candidly um, 
that I have been delighted and surprised by Bob Hill's leadership. Um, as an alum, I, I got a chance to engage with Bob on a couple of occasions. Um, it, it really was the advancement office that was keeping me engaged. So I give a lot of credit to Eric and, and to you, Jill, of course. Um, you know, I, I sort of put my faith in the heads of school elected by the board of trustees as an alum over time and didn't have much contact with um, the heads who have been here since um, Jenny Grubbs. Um, but I, I, I really say with all candor and authenticity, I, I've known several heads of school um, and um, Bob is a truly authentic, um, you know, really forward thinking, honest um, scholar of, of the field. Um, and it, he has invested a lot of time and energy into ensuring that not only that Nikki and I begin with real strength and um, comfort and affinity, and he's cultivating on the daily a true sense of belonging for both of us. Um, he's asking us for help, um, you know, positioning us as experts. I always talk about how great leaders um, really surround themselves with divergent thinkers. No, no one should be working in an echo chamber. Um, and you should surround yourself with people who are better at other things, in my opinion, than you are. Um, and I think Bob does that really well. He has a strong team that I feel lucky to work with. So I was very surprised to learn more about Bob and, and to just learn how authentic he is. Um, I have a very small child, but were it that I had a high schooler right now, I would feel so much confidence in, in how he is serving and living the mission, um, you know, here on campus for kids in grades seven through 12. So that's the true surprise for me. And Nikki, what surprised you the most? Um, I have two things because I do agree with Corey that Bob has been such a wonderful surprise and a really great person to work for. Um, boss and, uh, Bob and I have really frank and honest conversations about what's happening on this campus, what I hear from students, and um, we have really fruitful discussions and he wants to see things get better for students. So he is um, really... Um, he really is just like, he's really supportive in that way, in a way that's been incredibly surprising to me. Um, and I think though, what's also been incredibly um, surprising um, is that I know that issues, you know, DEIB work, I'm doing this work in the middle of kind of a culture war, right? Like there's a lot out there about DEIB work and everyone has positioned themselves as an expert in this field and have taken words and phrases that don't necessarily apply to the work and then have spun them into being things that they're not. So one of the things that I was really worried about when coming here was just thinking about what people were gonna think of my position, what they were gonna think about me being doing this work as a black woman and being the first black woman to be in a senior leadership role at Williston. Like that, that, was, that to me was a, was a lot to think about and a lot to process. Um, and um, and um, you know, I've been really pleasantly surprised by my welcome here. Um, and how excited people are to roll up their sleeves and do this work. Um, so it's nice to know that this is a strategic plan that doesn't just come from the board of trustees that has really the authentic backing of the rest of the community and that people really are excited to be in conversation. People are really excited to um, be in discussions. I have been hosting lunch and learns. Um, probably I think I'm on my third one. Um, and we have had really incredible and dynamic conversations about why it's so hard to talk about race. Like before we even go in to go have a conversation about race, like we need to talk about why it's hard. We need to talk about the discomfort. We need to talk about rhetorical incoherence. We need to talk about a clashing, we need to talk about clashing racial realities, right? We need to talk about how growing up in as a black person in this country is gonna give you a, set, a different experience than it is if you grow up as a white person in this country. And we need to talk about what happens when those two experiences collide and there's conversation, right? We need to talk about the discomfort that people are feeling. We need to talk about the fact that people are worried to say something because they think they're gonna be blamed. They feel guilty. We have to talk about it. Emotions are critical to DEIB work. People wanna skirt around emotions, we can't do it. We have to talk about it. Um, and it's only until we can get comfortable with the fact that these emotions are gonna come up for us, are we able to kind of dismantle that feeling and feel more comfortable stepping into it 
and having real conversations about race and racism and, and other issues pertaining to DEIB, right? Not just race and racism, but misogyny and heterosexism and transphobia and all of those different aspects that really um, create a human, right? All of these multifaceted identities that we hold. Um, we need to be able to have those conversations with our colleagues. We need to be able to have those conversations with our students so that they can watch us model how to do it with their peers. Um, and so that's, that's been really surprising is that people have been like, okay, let's do it. Let's step in it. Let's get messy. You know, so it's, it's been really great. And that the fact that they trust me to keep them safe enough um, to have those conversations and stay whole while they do it. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Paul. Jill. I was just also going to add this. I hope this is exciting for you to hear as well, that um, kind of dovetailing off what Nikki said, when I interviewed the faculty over the summer and was meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, um, I would say almost 90% of the faculty, when I asked them, you know, what are you hoping for this year? It said that they were really looking forward to being evaluated and being observed. And I have never heard teachers say that in, in my whole career. Um, and so that speaks to what Nikki's talking about as well. So kind of this thirst for growth and desire to be better and grow and do introspection and have hard conversations and get some great feedback on their teaching. So that bespeaks a really phenomenal teaching and learning culture here. Thank you. All right, we've got another question from Glenn. So Glenn, you're all set. Uh, thank you, Jill. Uh, Nikki was kind enough to send the link to the uh, D DEIB uh, strategic plan. And I was just thumbing through it. And um, I, I did see prominently the phrase anti-racism. And I, I wanted to ask both deans how they interpret that. I think, um, you know, it, it is, it's been relatively recent that we've kind of seen that term thrown around. It probably means different things to different people. And I was interested on your take on what that word means to you and, and how you kind of turn it into a verb. I'm glad that you said that it is a verb because it's not a fixed identity, right? You can be anti-racist in one moment and not be anti-racist in the next. So I appreciate you kind of um, identifying and naming that it's not necessarily a fixed state. Um, but I think that anti-racism is critical to equity, right? If we don't have anti-racism at the core of equity, then it's not equity. Um, if it's not at the core of diversity, then it's not diversity. If it's not at the core of inclusion, then it's incomplete, right? So I see anti-racism, right? Like the fact that you have to actively pursue it, right? It's not something that you can say like, I don't see color, right? Like that's not anti-racist. What is anti-racist is understanding that you do see color and what you want to do is mitigate that so that you can provide an inclusive experience so that every student in your classroom gets what they need to thrive. Um, so I see anti-racism as being mission critical to the success of this plan. Yeah, and I, and I agree. And, and Glenn, I appreciate it. You know, with Ibram Kendi's writing, you know, this term really became the focus for a lot of schools. You saw it as a summer reading text for a lot of schools. It was in the news. And, and I do think that he, he is a phenomenal scholar. And, and uh, I use the text at the school I most recently was um, serving as a leader in, in Washington, DC. Um, we, we talk about it as we seek to hire faculty who, who are identifying as anti-racist educators, I think, um, really taking an active posture. When we use that language in our classroom, certainly in the English department, because I am teaching in the English department, we're, we're using the sort of um, not antiquated, but concepts that I started my career with, um, you know, decades ago around being an upstander, not being a bystander. So really taking, as Nikki said, an active role when you hear something that, you know, you consider an ouch moment in schools, how can you, um, you know, engage with your classmates in a thoughtful discussion about what's been said. We talk about, you know, currently we're all reading a text. The entire school is reading Nickel Boys by Colson Whitehead because he'll be joining us um, as a, a writer in residence. Um, I'm not sure what the exact term is, but he'll be here for a day to talk to our students about writing. He'll talk about his um, text. Um, and, and that's a journey for our students. You know, we're really trying to cultivate brave spaces in our classes. We can't ensure that our classes feel safe to every child. I can't control that. Um, but I can ensure that it's a brave space where we will actively engage in anti-racist acts and we will um, talk about intent and impact in our language. We will think about how 
um, even statements made benignly um, it, based in a lack of knowledge or lack of um, study um, or possibly based in our own you know, racialized experience as beings in the world, not always benign. Sometimes that can land in a traumatic way or in a challenging way, can activate someone in your class um, or an adult in your life, you know, and, and so how do we navigate that again to prepare students for, you know, a, a, a democratic world where they have to dialogue across difference and they have to take stands on um, things and have courage of conviction um, as they move through the world. It's not enough to watch the world happen around you. And, and what else would be the true embodiment, I think, of living a life of purpose and integrity? Yeah, no, so thank you both for those those answers. I, I, and Connie, I think you, you helped answer a follow-up, but I'll, I'll just kind of uh, say the comment that was in my mind. Um, you know, sometimes um, teaching and living in an anti-racist institution can be confrontational. And how do you make sure that the end result of that confrontation is better than whatever you had before the confrontation? Because it's not automatic, obviously. And, and sometimes, you know, you can, you can end up with really frayed feelings where there's a lack of trust and then the sharing is is um, somebody puts a cap on their sharing because they don't wanna be in that confrontational situation anymore. So it's, it's obviously so important. I, I was really gratified to see it in the plan, but I also know how potentially dangerous it can be. It can be a lightning rod in some situations. Um, so I, I appreciate the answer that you gave because it is a very delicate balance. Yeah, and I think um, one of the hallmarks, I hope, you know, if, um, if Nikki and I got the chance to look back on our time, you know, 10, 20 years from now at Williston, um, one of the greatest moments thus far for me is that Nikki and I agreed this, this is a long game. We really need to take our time. Um, and I think schools have rushed into DEIB work, um, again, commendably, but, but we wanted to be sure that we began with work with the faculty on their own identity. We wanted students to be talking about identity in their classes as well, and how that is our starting place. Where are we coming from? What is the picture of our own composition? And how does that inform how we move throughout the world? How does my identity meet yours? And how do we find common ground? And how do we share beautiful differences? Um, and so a lot of work, again, has been done in advance of Nikki and I arriving at Williston. That's very important to name, um, especially last year, but certainly over the course of time. Um, and I, I really, Nikki and I are looking forward to being very deliberate and methodical and taking our time to make small steps to really advance the school. We will be looking at curriculum and content. Um, we will be doing more identity workshop. We've done some implicit bias work with the faculty. We'll continue to do that work. Um, Nikki's already been into um, different offices throughout the school um, to, to talk with them about how, how they approach the work in their space and place on campus. So. Um, you know, trying not to rush, trying to be really purposeful in this effort. And one of the things that I try to emphasize in my work is that racial healing is not linear, right? It's not going to be like a path directly up a mountain, right? Where you're like one step at a time and we're going up this mountain and one day we're going to get to the top and that we don't have to do anything because we've made it, right? And that's not the reality of this work. This work is a life long journey, um, that this is going to be work, this is Williston's lifelong journey, that issues of DEIB need to be fully integrated into the fabric of Williston, right? Like, if we're not teaching inclusively, then we're not teaching. If we're not, if we're not teaching with an equity lens, we're not teaching, right? So we have to make sure that what we're focused on is going to really ensure that this that's going to set Williston up for a lifelong journey of DEIB. That as long as the doors of Williston Northampton School are open, that we will continue to do this work, um, and it's important. Um, so I just wanted to note that you know this work isn't linear, and some and it starts on the individual level, right? As as Corey mentioned, right? Like this is it starts with a critical examination of the self. How, what were the subliminal messages that you received about diversity and, um, inclu and inclusion, right? And it, and it can start at home and the interpersonal. What are the conversations you're having with other people? 
where have you grown up and how has that dictated who you've gone to school with, who you've been in conversation with. Um, and one of the really beautiful things about schools that I can tell you, not just on the um, secondary level, but in higher education, is that oftentimes for a lot of students, um, these are the spaces that are gonna be the most diverse spaces they will ever enter in their entire lives. So what we have a real opportunity to really make the most of our time with these students on campus to have these really critical conversations that will do nothing but benefit them in academic and social spaces beyond the walls of Williston. So thank you for that, Nikki. And I wanna be conscious of the time here. We're, we're wrapping up and I wanna make sure that um, particularly our two educators who are back in the mix bright and early tomorrow morning um, have some time to enjoy their evening. But since this is an alumni call, uh, I would be remiss if I did not ask each of you to briefly um, share your thoughts such as you might have on how the alumni can support you in your work. Nikki, do you wanna go first? Yeah, I would say that um, alums have already been incredibly helpful in my work. Um, Akela and Ashela, who are on this call now, I was in conversation with them before I started at Williston um, and hearing their experiences with Williston and hearing people who love Williston enough, because I think you really have to love an institution to be brave enough to critique it. Um, I truly believe that in my gut. Um, and I've been so grateful to be in conversation with these wonderfully mature women um, and Natalie Romaine, who have been really helpful in getting me to kind of understand like from the perspectives of being students of color in this community, where they feel Williston has shown up for them and when, where Williston hasn't. And so it's been really informative as I've embarked on my journey here. So I think alums have already been incredibly helpful to me. I see Bryant just joined the call and I'm in conversation with Bryant pretty frequently. Um, and so I would say that alums have already been um, involved, but I think one of the great ways to continue to be involved is to stay curious um, and to stay and to ask questions about the work. I invite questions. I invite, I invite questions. I invite skepticism. I, I invite criticism. Um, and I know that when you say that to alums, you open up the floodgates, but that's fine because I am, I am affirmed in my work and I am affirmed in my expertise and I am affirmed in the support that I have to do this work here at Wilson. So if you have any questions that extend after um, our time together today, know that my door is always open for you. Yeah, and um, I would, I would, I love that language is, of stay curious and, and stay in communication. I would echo that, you know, the, the, there's so many different ways to connect with the school um, as an alum. And I think we do love hearing from you. So please don't hesitate to reach out, to ask us about what's happening in classes, to be inquisitive and um, get information about what's happening on campus. Come back and see what's happening. We, we would welcome you. We would be so thrilled to have you see truly the, you know, the safety, the joy, um, the cultivation of purpose, passion, and integrity that, that is, you know, living here on campus. Um, we had our trustees back on campus a week ago, and Angela, it's great to see you, and it was great to see several other trustees and um, really have them ask us some great questions, and, and I believe in that. Keep us honest. Um, I would also say that, you know, our, our alums, our, our current parents, past parents are our best resource for referring individuals to the school. And so, you know, I would ask if you have a talented educator or an aspiring educator who's interested in a career, you know, an informational interview is, is fine. It's wonderful. If we don't have an open position, I'll still take that call. Absolutely. Um, have that person come to campus and shadow another faculty member. Um, I think a lot has gone on in the field of education in the last five years. And I do believe that there will be, you know, another departure of young, talented educators who are just feeling really, you know, um, a lot of hardship around this last year in particular. And I would hate to see good talent. I would hate to see um, 
you know, BIPOC educators leave the profession entirely because of the tremendous trauma that has gone on in our nation and, and because of changes in schools. So anytime you can refer candidates to the school, please do that. Please don't hesitate to pick up the phone. Um, you are our best resource. Um, you know the space and place well, and, and we grow and we evolve and we get better um, every time we add a new member to our community to complement the already really talented staff. Thank you. And thank you for offering um, such proactive ways that people can engage since we're recording this. We know that a lot of uh, other alumni will have a chance to see it. So um, I hope they watch all the way through to this part and um, take you at your word. Um, for those of you who've tuned in, just a reminder that if you go to the uh, williston.com alumni events page, you can see upcoming events. Uh, some which will be happening in real life as we begin to gather again in person. And I know that at some of these, we will be bringing our faculty, including Corey and Nikki. So you might have a chance to encounter them in real life in some way. Um, and before we wrap up, I know that Eric Yates had wanted to say just a few words and I'm gonna turn it over to Eric and then uh, thank you for your time and wish you all a good evening. Yeah, thanks, Jill. I just wanted to say, um, personally, this is my 12th year at Williston, and we've had, you know, a great uh, last decade under Bob Hill's leadership and a very stable, uh, experienced administrative team along the way, and that's been an important part of the school's success. But I just want to say, personally, um, how much I appreciate Nikki and Corey joining the school at this time their um, involvement and engagement with the school right now has just been personally really meaningful to me and I know to many of my colleagues, not only in advancement, but on the admin team. And they're, they're really making, um, they're, they're pushing us to think about new things, but also um, just, just uh, making, making our work more uh, exciting. And um, I'm, I'm just, really very pleased that uh, they're they're working with us. So I just wanted to share that because, you know, having an experienced stable team is really important to the school's continuity, but so is new ideas and fresh perspectives. And Nikki and Corey bring that um, a lot. So, so thank you. And uh, thanks to all of you for uh, attending tonight. I know we're gonna have more of these conversations and uh, yeah, thanks so much and have a great night. All right, thank you everyone for joining. We'll look forward to seeing you on another event soon or in person. Have a great night.